Oh, uh, y'all still training. You're just going to clap after everything today, aren't you? Everything. That's good. You want to grab your Bibles, you can go to Luke 14. There's Bibles in the pew. We're going to put it on the screen. If you've got a smartphone, you go to you version. Um, the notes are live there. You can get a hold of We've made it possible for you to be able to follow along and take notes as much as we possibly can. So if you can't follow along today, you're the problem. <laughs> That's just me not taking responsibility anymore today. A watch. Why would I wear one of those? Not worth it. We're going to be over in Luke chapter 14. We just finished seven weeks of starting over. Seven weeks of deciding if we had had the right relationship with God from the beginning, if we had started our walk of faith the correct way, or if we had bridged the gap between our childlike faith and our adult faith. We just finished that. If you want to catch up on that, you've got to go to the internet uh, and kind of catch up. Because today, not starting any new series, we're still starting, we, we've already started over. So now, it's reflection time. It's time for you to look back on your life. It's time for you to look back on your day, okay, or your week. What you will be, um, you, what you will try to do today is attempt to do these things in an effort to be a disciple. That's not how this works. The Bible was not put here. I want to make a couple of statements and it's going to freak one or two of you out. Just hold with me. The Bible was not put here so that you could go and simply find out how to act. Yes, I have said many times the Bible will teach you how to respond to every situation in your life. Every single situation. But it responds in only one way. Jesus. It responds with how Jesus interacted. Every story in the Bible is about one thing and one thing only. Jesus. Every story. Jonah being swallowed by a whale? Jesus. Moses rescuing Israelites? Jesus. Every single story. There is no story about anything except for Jesus in the Bible. If you found yourself a story in the Bible that you don't think is about Jesus, you're wrong. Sorry. That's just what the book's about. So the book is not available for you to just open up and go, well, I need to get a new job. I wonder what the Bible says about that. It's going to say, follow Jesus. That's what it says. That's the answer. How do you follow Jesus in your job? It's in there. But that's how you do it. You follow Jesus in your job and you're finding your job, where you should live, how you should act, what you should do. It's all about Jesus, nothing else. So the whole basic instructions before leaving earth, not, okay, is unless you consider basic instruction be follow Jesus every minute, then I'll go with that, an acronym. But we're going to look at what Five marks. The Bible has them listed out. Jesus said it and told us. Five marks of a disciple. Like I said, it's not for you to make sure you do so that you are. It's for you to reflect and see if you already are because that's how the Bible works. It tells you how you're acting if you already are a follower of Christ. It never ever tells you how to act so that you can be a follower of Christ. It never even says how you should act to appear like one. That's not what it's for. So Jesus lays this out so that you can look at your life and you can go, yes, that's how I am. Yes, that's how I am. Ooh, I need work there. I need to work there. I need to adjust how I'm following Christ in that area of my life so that I can represent Christ as a disciple. That's how this thing works. That's how we're going to... Uh, kind of look out. Uh, it was really cool. I looked uh, looking through comedians, and he was talking about funny things. And he, he's from Russia, and he was amazed when he got to America because he found powdered milk. He ran on the back, add water, boom, got milk. He went to another island, he found powdered eggs. Add water, you got eggs. He said he chuckled because he got to the baby care item, he found baby powder. He was like, "This is cool." Get it? And okay. It's okay. But you and I, hold on, you and I, we add a little water. We think, boom, you walk down an aisle, you say, hey, I want to follow Christ. Throw me some water. We baptize them and boom, you got a Christian. Not quite true. Not quite true. I've taught many, many times the Christianity part happens way before the water. Water's just an example. 
It's a, it's a representation of what happened. You and I love to have outward influence so that we can prove what we are, so that we can get to where we want to be, especially when it comes to God. But in Luke 14, we have Jesus. He's getting closer and closer and closer to the cross. His ministry is starting to come to a head, basically. Uh, it's, it's not miracle time anymore. Hey, feeding 5,000, feeding 4,000, raising people from the dead. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. All that stuff is kind of dwindling away. It's not, not doing as many of those. Now he's starting to weed the crowd out. And that's what he's talking about here today. He's going to say, here's what this really looks like. I know you were attracted. I know you attracted to the miracles. I'm sure he was thinking. And I'm sure they were after him for the many things he could do. The Bible tells us that. They were falling around for the things he could do for them. And now he's going to turn around and go, okay, now I got you all together. Here's what it's going to be really like to, to follow me. This is what it's going to look like as a disciple. And you will notice, as, as you read on farther in the story after today, I challenge you to do that, people started to leave the crowd. People, people just decided, not for me. Not for me. Some of them decided to hang on for a little while. And then when the going got really tough, that's when they checked out. And you can find yourself in there. It's not a real popular message. Wasn't a popular message then. It's kind of like the chicken and the hog who were sitting around the farm. They were talking about their contribution to the upcoming holiday dinner. And the chicken said, let's bring bacon and eggs. And the pig said, that's cool for you. That's just a contribution. But for me, it's a whole life commitment. Okay, Baptist, did you get that? The pig's going to die. It's bacon. You're not Jewish. You can have the bacon. Wow. Okay. That's what it's like. That's what Jesus is going to tell these people. That's what he tells you. This is not a contribution. I don't need a contribution to Christianity. I'm not enlisting army of soldiers so that you can help me out. I am asking for your whole life commitment. And when you give me your whole life commitment, then he's going to list these five things. And he loses some pretty cool images. So let's read them, and I'll mark them as we get through them, uh, the five marks, and then we're going to open them back up and look at each one. So here we go, Luke chapter 14, I think it's verse 25. Large crowds, that's it, we're traveling uh, with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, making sure I'm reading the right version, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot, you might want to underline the word cannot, be my disciple. That's mark number one. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Mark number two. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays down the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. It's Mark number three. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with, thin, with, with the thousand men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Mark number four. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. That's Mark number five. He who has ears, let him hear. You see, what I found is that people follow Christ on different levels of intimacy. It's like a set of circles. And I tried all morning long to get you some circles printed on the screen. We failed. So now you've got to use your image, your, your mind. Great big circle, let's pretend there's a great big circle on the screen. And above it, we've wrote the word crowd. And that's what Jesus is dealing with. He's dealing with a great big crowd of people. It's a big circle. And he's in the middle. And then there's another circle inside that outer circle. And we call it the congregate or the congregation. It's where people who've decided, yeah, you know what, this Jesus guy, I, I kind of get what he's saying. And so what they'll do in modern day, they'll go and they'll just go to church. They don't care what church. They don't care um, what, what kind of church. 
they'll go, they'll go to this church and that church and they'll hop around and, and they'll just kind of hang out with other believers periodically and that's kind of the extent of their following Christ's life. Okay, so that's the other circle. Then there's another circle. We call it the local church. It's, this is the believers who have, who have who've kind of settled into their town and, and they go to church every Sunday and they go to church every Wednesday unless there's something else going on or the weather's bad or, you know... It, they're, they're, they've got their church, and they call it my church, and when they're driving by with their boss or their friend, they go, oh, I go to church there, and that's their church, that's that third circle. But then there's a fourth circle, and the fourth circle resides within the local church, and it's called the committed core. That's where you find disciples. That's where you find discipleship happening. Because it's no longer about that church. It's no longer about uh, the congregation of people. It's, not, it's about Christ himself. And yes, he's always at the local church, Mondays and Wednesdays and every other time he can, because of that core committedness. That's why he's there. And yes, he's always gathering with other believers no matter what's going on. He wants to hang out with other Christians because of that core committed relationship. And he's always within the crowd. He's always hanging out. Maybe he's at the outside edge or he's at the end. He doesn't matter. He's just there and he's being with the crowd because of that core centered commitment. Because of Christ causes him to do everything that he does. And that is the deepest level of commitment. And that's the people that Jesus is addressing in these five marks. Those center as close as he can get. Jesus talked about a few of these things, about taking up his cross to his, his, just his closest disciples too. And he spoke to these guys. And he speaks to you today. The first thing, let's go back and look. First one he said, first you, the first image he uses is like a family. Okay? And he compares your Christian walk to your family life. Because our family life is the closest relationship on the planet that we have. And here's what Jesus says. If you're a disciple, you will hate them. Now, some of you are going, I must be a big Jesus follower, because I hate them all. Not what he's saying. Not what he's saying. First of all, the word's a little different than what we know. It's not hate like you and I hate. It is just love above the other. That's all it means. So, the, what Jesus is saying is, you take and you look at your family relationships, and you must love me above them. You must love me more than you love them. The love you have for me will actually help you love them. I read one preacher's sermon that said, How to Hate Your Wife. Weird. But it was phenomenal teaching on loving God more than you love your wife. Therefore and thereby, your wife feeling more love. It's weird how it works. You see, that's what Jesus wants us to understand. It's not about the not loving the family as much. It's about loving Him more. It's about wanting and believing and knowing that you're going to follow Him above your family issues, above your family desires. He is going to direct your path more than your family will. He says, if you're my disciple, that's what's going to be going on in your life. You must love me more than any body else. And your love for Jesus, in comparison, will seem like you hate your family. Is that you? Does it, does it feel like that to you? Or have you got in your heart, your kids, your grandkids, your spouse, are they elevated above your love for God? When you look at that, do you say, I, it's kind of like equal to me. Yeah, I love them as much as I love them. It's not discipleship. Discipleship is loving Him more than you do. The only way we can see this example is if you see a Muslim. If you watch a Muslim who's converted to Christianity, their family actually has a funeral for him. A, a literal funeral. He is dead to that family. Amish are kind of the same way, but Muslims take it really to the extent. That guy loves his God, his Jesus, way more than he loves his family. And that's kind of, kind of, what it should feel like to you. 
do you love God more than you love your family? Matthew 10, 22. Um, what does it say? I forgot. I wrote it down. You will be hated by everyone because of me. You're not going to be hated because, from everyone because you're a pig. That's not what it says. You're not going to be hated by everyone because you're a Jesus freak and you Bible thump them. That's not why. He says you'll be hated by everyone because of me. Because you love me more than everybody else, they're going to not love you as much. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And then verse 37, it comes back and it says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Father, mother, come on, now Jesus, what are you talking about mom and dad for? Bad. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than come on now, that's my kids. And some of you are going, hey, you didn't say grandkids, I'm good. Loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy. Not worthy of me? Not worthy. Any relationship you put above Christ proves your lack of discipleship. That's what he says. Sorry, I didn't write it. Next thing he gives us is a cross. Basically, Jesus is saying, live like a dead person. Mark number two is, he says, take up your cross and follow me. We used to sing a song when I was growing up back at Lawndale Baptist, no, Cairo Baptist Church, The Cross I Bear. Anybody know that song? Oh, two or three people. You know what I used to think it said? The Cross I Bear. Cross I Bear? I mean, man, I, when I was growing up, I thought, man, if I meet a bear in the woods, I hope he is cross-eyed. They won't be able to catch me. I don't know why we're singing about this in church, but it sounds good. But the cross I bear. Now, then Jesus is saying, this cross, you, listen, we don't get this. You and I don't get it. How many of you all are wearing crosses around your neck? Go ahead, I'm going to make you show it if you don't raise your hand. No. Okay, you got one of those. How many of you got one hanging on your wall at the house? Yeah, me, I do, absolutely. You got a picture of one? Mm-hmm. Maybe a bracelet? Now, how many of y'all have an electric chair hanging up on your house? How about a syringe? No drug addicts. You got a syringe hanging on your wall? You walk by it and go, that's good stuff right there. Great decoration. Why has the cross been simply minimalized to jewelry and an icon? Yes, it means a lot because of what happened there. But we don't do that to the same icons in our culture that was used or is used for the same way the cross was. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. I met a woman one time who said, I have migraine headaches. It's just my cross to bear. I had another guy show me his toe. Nasty. Ingrown toenail, he said, it's plagued him. He says, I guess it's just my cross to bear. And I'm like, really? Migraine headaches and ingrown toenails. That's the cross. Why don't you just go to the doctor and get that funkiness cut out? That's not, the cro That's not a cross to bear. Are you kidding me? A cross to bear means you'll die on it. A cross to bear means you will die to this life. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He died to physical life. Died there. Just like an electric chair. Just like a lethal syringe. Just like a firing squad. Just like all those things. That's how He died. He died. The cross you're wearing around your neck is an execution device. And Jesus says, if you want to take it up, Take it up, but you better take it up in your life, and that means you will die to that life. So he's basically saying, live like a dead guy. What does that mean? Well, Paul understood it in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. I myself, I Paul, or if it was me, I saw it, no longer live. It's not me who lives, but Christ lives in me. So, old John Dad, I'm not there anymore. I don't live my life anymore. I don't have a plan for my life. If I was at Dale Carnegie School, I'd be kicked out because I don't plan for my life. I let Christ make the plans 
for my life. And that's the mark of a disciple. Are you living your life or is Christ living your life? And are you living Christ's life? That's the mark. Have you got a plan and then ask God if He'll bless it? You ever seen that one? I'll come together, let's all ask God to bless what we're doing here. That's a massive screw up. How about let's all gather together and find out what God wants us to do? Much better off. See, that's one option, living your life and asking God to jump along. The other is living what God has for you to live. That's the mark of a disciple. Then Paul goes on in Galatians 5.24. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. That take up your cross. You've crucified life. You've killed the life. What you, what you want to do is dead. You, you deny it. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning as well. You deny your life. Every single day, your life, this worldly life, will come to you and say, Hey, let's do this. And you have to say, No. That's denying. Take up your cross means I've killed that. And I'm following Him. Every day. Every day your life will come to you and ask you to follow it. Make choices that are good for you. Make choices that are good for your careful family. We've already talked about that. Only work out well for the family. Only work out well for you. Maybe just your spouse. Maybe your kids. Maybe your grandkids. Maybe whatever. No. Follow me. And in Galatians 6.14, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. May I not boast in anything I do, but only in the fact that my life is dead, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. I don't even live by that example. I don't even follow the world. I don't, I don't dig with the world. I mean, we could go into politics here. We could go into economics. We, you know, but I don't know where you're dabbling in the world. But wherever it is... That's what should have happened. The world should have been crucified to you. Shouldn't even it, 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 It's on your radar, it's around you, but it's dead to you. It has no meaning. You're following Christ. But can I participate? Can I, can I be? Yeah, of course you can. Of course you can. But you better love God more. And that's what better, that's what should be seen. That's a mark of the cycle. Third mark he gives us, the tower. Tower. Man, this has been used to teach common sense for years. Rick Reed just told me a story this week about a place he knew that came together and said, we're going to build this on faith. To me, that's building on stupidity. Faith doesn't build anything. Now, Christ can build things. And the verse we read said, Who embarks on building a tower without first counting the cost? Now, first counting the cost. This is a disciple. So, how do we plan it? Suppose one of you wants to build a tower and won't first sit down and estimate the cost if you have enough to complete it. Well, if you don't have enough to complete it, what should you do? Go ahead and say it. Don't start. That's what he said. Jesus goes on after that and says, because what you'll do is you'll stick the foundation in, you won't get done, and people are going to walk by and go, <laughs> you moron. You moron. And that's the result. That's the reason that he tells you not to do it. Because He says, because people will come by, see your foundation, and laugh at you. I thought I wasn't supposed to care what people think. You aren't. You're supposed to care what people think about God. And what he said was, they will come by, see your foundation, laugh at you, and you'll be a laughing stock about me. Hmm. Go ahead. That's where you go. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so how does that apply to your life? Well, if you're taught that you have to love God more than your family, hmm, should I be a disciple? Should I follow Christ? That's what he's saying. Should you follow Christ is this starting point that you should be asking yourself, if I'm going to follow Christ, am I willing to give it all up in the beginning? 
Because as you read the Bible after you are following Christ, you're going to read back. And the Bible's going to go, hey, this is how you know you're following me. You counted it at the beginning and decided you didn't want to have any of that stuff. You only want me. You said in the beginning, you can handle it. You said you are willing to pay the whole price. Because what's going to happen is you're going to launch and you're going to go, I'm following Jesus and I'm going to do all these things. And people are going to look at you and they're going to go, I want to be like Him. And then you're going to piddle out. You're going to fall flat on your face and you're going to go, I can't do it anymore. I can't follow Him that far. I don't want to go that much. I only want to do this little bit. I want to go as far as I can and then I'm not going to be able to go any farther. And boom, people are going to look at you and go, ha ha, you moron. Why'd you say it in the beginning anyway? And Jesus looks at you and says, Hey, listen, it's not about you, it's about me. Now, they're not going to follow me because you couldn't follow me. So don't go out there and tell people you're going to follow me and then halfway do it. Count the cost ahead of time. Count them. And if you're looking back and you're going, Hey, you're not a disciple. But Pastor Son... Can I be a Christian and just backslide? Ah! It says, look at your life and determine if you are a disciple. Not look at your life and make sure you're staying a disciple. You'll already be these things if you're a disciple. You're telling me that I may be looking at my life and I piddled out, I said I'd do, but I won't do, and I kind of tried to do, but now I can't complete. Now you're telling me I'm not even a disciple because of it? I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you that. So maybe you need to go, you're right, God, I wasn't a disciple. But I want to be. But I want to be. So Jesus will say, count the cost. Before you build that tower, before you say yes to me, Make sure you're willing to go all the way. And I heard one guy preach one time, says, you know what? I don't, as long as I get to heaven, all that matters. So far off the discipleship path. I heard one guy tell me, I don't care if I get a mansion, I just want an outhouse in heaven. Please. It's not about you, where you live. Discipleship's an everyday thing. And Jesus says, you better look ahead and find out that I'm going I'm to ask for everything out of your life. I'm going to ask you to turn it all to me. Your job, your business, your family, your money. You're going to have to let go of it. It's not yours anyway. But, 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 nope. Count it. Count it. Make sure you're willing to give it all up. Make sure you can afford to do this before you follow me. Philippians 1.6 Paul said, being confident of this, because this is cool. He's the one that started it. That he who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion. You see, Jesus lives by what he said and he asked you to do. How would it be in your life if you go going about life and you're walking along with Jesus and all of a sudden you do something or, or, or something starts to happen and Jesus goes, I'm busy. I'm busy. You're going to have to work that one out on your own. Yeah, no, I've got some other things I've got to do today. Sorry. How would it be? I mean, he just dropped you. Boop. Who would follow him? Jesus says, not going to happen. I'm going to carry this work. I'm going to work daily in your life and I will see this work to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That final, Jesus is going to work in your life. God is going to fulfill your life and He's going to build your life until the day that you're in heaven. Not build your life so that you can get to heaven. But build your life until you get there. And if you're a disciple, you've looked ahead and you've said, I don't care what it costs. I will do it. And that's good news. Because we're not finished yet. We're not, we're not dead yet. We're not standing at the day of Christ Jesus. We're not standing. You've got time. If you're hearing this today, you've still got time to decide that the cost is worth it to follow Christ and that you will follow Him. Knowing that there's going to be a time that you will have to deny yourself and follow Him through something. 
You might know. Billy Sunday had this quote. I don't, even, he, he, I don't think he was planning it. It just fits right there. He said, stopping at third adds no more to the score than striking out. It doesn't matter how well you start if you fail to finish. A true disciple is going to finish strong. A true, disi- a true disciple, they're not going to work to finish strong. They're just automatically going to finish strong. If you're a Jesus follower, you finish all the way. You're fully committed. What good is it if you're good out of the gate but then can't finish the race? There's no ribbon for participation in this thing. Everybody wins if you finish. If you finish. I'm sorry if you've been told before that you can become a Christian and then be an idiot all your life and then die and Jesus is still going to put you up there and go, oh, it's good. I just don't think it's taught that way. I just don't think that's... Well, I can't find it anywhere. The Bible says that was... Mouth service. Revelation calls it lukewarm. And I don't know if you know what Jesus does with lukewarm stuff. He hurls it. Hmm. Yeah, he don't just spit it. He hurls it. Listen to my puke sermon a couple years ago. Fourth thing he gives us. Surrender to the stronger king. What does that mean? What does that mean? Who, who in their right mind, if you want to be a disciple, who in their right mind goes, gets ready to go against the king... And then, and then, and then the, the war's about to happen and, and the, the lesser king looks out and sees that the king has a whole lot more people than they got. How many of the lesser kings would go, let's go do it. Let's go get them. We can do this. Nobody. Nobody does that. What they do, they smart. Right? They send somebody out and they go, hey, can't we just get along? That sounds right, right? You've got 20,000 men marching at you. You've only got 10,000 men. What would you rather happen? Live in harmony. That's what I would want to happen. And that sounds good. Sounds right, right? Makes sense. Well, put yourself in Jesus' day and find out what he was really telling these guys had to happen. Because here's what happened whenever a king with 10,000 men looked over a hill that had 20,000 men coming at him. They sent a delegation out to make peace. Do you know how peace happened? The lesser king with the 10,000 men became the slave of the king who had 20,000 men. You gave up. It wasn't make peace, live together in happy harmony, peace, love, joy, and happiness. It was, we give up. When you went out with your delegation, you were carrying this flag. You know what color it is? White. Give up. You surrender. You're no longer a king. You're no longer going to fight. Jesus says that if you're a disciple, you have looked at the king, who is God, you're the lesser king. You've decided that that king is way more powerful than you, and you are admitting that you have no hope of beating him, and that you are surrendering your whole life to him and will become his slave. And we call it a bond servant. Because you willingly go and do that. Jesus says a disciple is someone who has looked at their life and said, there's no way I can win this. I give up, and I'm going to let God be my master. So have you? See, I don't know. read a story about a lifeguard who's standing on the beach and he sees a guy drowning. He's, out, he, he's about, to, about to go down. He's waving, flailing, he's fighting, he's yelling, he's screaming. People have gathered around the beach and the lifeguard wades out to ankle deep water and stands there and watches. And the guy fights a little more and he screams, help, 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 I'm about to... And he's playing. And the lifeguard wades out to about his knees. He just stands there. At this time, the people on the shore are yelling at him, dude, you got to do something. What is wrong with you? About that time, the guy starts to sink. The lifeguard charges out at full speed, swimming, grabs the guy and brings him back. But instead of yelling, hero, lifeguard saved him, they start ridiculing him. Hey, why didn't you get out there and save the guy before? Why did you let him almost drown? The lifeguard said, oh, wait a minute. You saw how he was acting. 
If I'd have swam out there while he was wailing and flailing and beating and screaming, he'd have drowned his boat. It wasn't until he gave up the fight that I could help him get back to shore. And that's exactly what happens in your life. You have to stop this. You have to stop this fighting with God. You have to stop fighting life. And you have to give up. I think it's cool when you sing praise songs and you raise your hand. I hope you understand what that means. It's like, you know, the policemen say, put them up. It's still the global representation of I surrender. Hands up. And Jesus says, if you're a disciple, that's how you're walking in life. Got nothing to do with it. I'm not directing my own steps. God, this is yours. Giving it up. Not me. Not me. Not me. I'd really like to, but I'm having to deny. Not me. Mm -mm. Not me. I got you got this. You got this, God. I really think I I really think God but you got this. I mean it'd be really smart though if I went You got this. Deny. 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 Hands up. Hands up. And that's the picture of how you're supposed to be walking around. Not to be a disciple if you are a disciple. That's how you already are walking around. Surrender. Surrender. Last one. Mark 5 is about salt. Why does he talk about salt? Well, when Jesus is talking about it, it was pretty valuable because they didn't have an old fridge or nine freezers in the basement of the church like we do, plugged up, keeping things fresh and frozen and things we can preserve and use later. They didn't have that. So they had salt. They would take salt, they'd rub it on meat, they'd rub it on anything that they didn't want to spoil, and the salt would stop the process of rot. That's what salt does. Stops the process of rot. How are you stopping the process of rot and therefore being a disciple at the same time? Well... Here's a couple of examples. You can grab yourself a board and you can go pick it outside of an abortion clinic. You can do that. You can pick it outside of a church who says homosexuality is great. You can do that. Yeah, right? God hates man. God hates man. You can do that. You can, you, can, you can preserve the earth. What it says. You can preserve the earth. You can do that. It wouldn't be right. But you can do it. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You're preserving the earth. How are you preserving the earth? How are you yourself, as a disciple, preserving the earth? Here's how. When you're out in the world, you've already got jobs. You don't need to quit your jobs and become a missionary in Afghanistan. That's not preserving the earth, okay? You're out there. You've got a life. And then all of a sudden, a standard comes up. And you've got to make a choice. That standard or God's standard? When you choose God's standard, you're preserving the earth. In some weird accounting thing that God has set up, you have preserved the earth. You are still salty. Salarium argentinum. That's the Latin phrase for what we get. Salary. You ever heard anybody say they're not worth their salt? We've carried this all the way into our culture. Didn't even know it. Salt's very valuable. Are you very valuable? Are you very valuable to what? Are you very valuable to your employer? Are you very valuable to the economy? Are you doing what's good for the economy? Are you helping others? That, that way he's talking about? Are you salt that way? No. Are you valuable to the kingdom of God in preserving the earth? Do you have any value to God's kingdom in preserving the earth. Are you able to live your life and all of a sudden be, be this salt that they don't understand? That this, that just kind of you're you're weird in a, some sort of way. Maybe you, you you've chosen a path that doesn't make sense to them. If you were to sit across from your accountant, he would look at you with a dumb look and go, "How?" If you were to look sit across the, from a from an IRS guy. Because you've got a different standard than, than, than the world does about how you manage your money and how you spend your money. He would look at you and go, why? Don't you know you should have given more here and got a better tax break there? Don't you? 
No, no. God didn't tell me to do that with my money that day. He told me to do it over there. He told me to give it to the guy on the side of the street. Did you get a receipt? No, I didn't get a receipt. I just gave it away. How can you get the tax break? Sorry, I'm not going on that tangent. It's not about that. Are you salt? Are you being salt to the earth? Are you preserving the earth? Preserving. Why are you preserve? Why would we want to preserve the earth? Because it's valuable to God's kingdom. Because the more you are salt in the earth, the more people are attracted to Christ. You see, when you make decisions that have no bearing on the world, it doesn't even make sense to the world sometimes. They get to look at your life and go, Man, how does he make it? How do they live? Why is he so happy? Why are they why do they have so much joy? And they got nothing. They don't make good choices. They don't do this. They don't do that. But I like it. I like it. We've preserved it. Matthew 5.13, Jesus then says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So, if I am a Christian and I am salt, can I lose my saltiness? If I am salt, can I lose my saltiness? No. No. If I'm not salty, guess what I'm not? Thank you. If I'm not salty, I ain't salt. There's a guy named... Do you know that there's people who really study this stuff? No, seriously. There's a guy named Lenny. Lenny. There he is. Lanny Bridges works for Morton Salt in guess where? Grand Saline. S A L I N E. That's where he works. That's where Morton Salt Company is. He works for Morton Salt. He says this. He says, We have salt crystals that have been mined a thousand years ago. And they're just as salty today as they are as they were then, and they will be just as salty a thousand years from now. Because we have found out that salt never ever, ever loses its saltiness. Never. Nothing can take away the saltiness of salt. Now what's really weird is that Jesus lived in a time where they got their salt from the Dead Sea sometimes. Sometimes. And that salt had so much crap in it that after it evaporated, they put it on their meat and the meat would still rot. They would take that salt and they would stick it on their food, thinking, man, this is going to be salty. But guess what non-salt is not? Salty. Non-salt is never salty. It has to be salt to be salty. What they had was not real salt. They had a little bit of salt from the water, but the rest of it was just garbage. Jesus says, that's losing the salt. It's fake. It's not real salt. So the only way for you to not be salty to the earth is for you to not be a disciple. For you to not be salt at all. So you're saying, I ain't saying nothing. I'm asking you to look at your life and ask yourself, are you salt to the earth? And if you're not, what you're not is a disciple, not a disciple. If you're not salty, you're not salt. You fake salt. But I'm doing all these things. So? But I'm here all the time. So? Isn't it enough? It's enough for fake salt. But underneath, when we apply your life to the world, it still rots. You don't preserve anything. But I want to be a disciple. Well, then look at your life. And ask yourself if you're salty or not. If you're doing what it takes in this world for the world to be preserved underneath you. Are you salt? I saw another little plaque 
was at a general store and it said, Danger, beware of dog. And the story is this guy walked into that store and all he saw was this old, big, floppy deered dog laying on the rug. And when he walked in, the dog just looked up. Not even a wolf. And he walked over to the guy behind the counter and says, <laughs> Your son says, Beware of dog. Is that him? He said, yeah. People were tripping over him. So I thought I better put the sign up. Beware, dog. <laughs> What's that got to do with you? You can take that one home and figure it out yourself. Some of us are going to get it quicker. Some of us need to study a little more. Are you a real disciple? Ask the question. You know. You've got to remember those circles. Are you just part of the crowd? Are you kind of the congregation? Do you like coming to church? Is it kind of important to you? Or are you following Christ? And you can move your way through those circles. Everybody started at the outside circle. Nobody jumped into this as a committed core. It's like, you didn't get that. You were made for the same. By walking down that circle. So where are you at? Because if you're not in the center, you're in one of them other places, and you're going in one of two directions. So if we've started over and we now, want to know, we now know what it's like to be a Christian and to follow Christ, we've said yes. Yeah. Use these scriptures to look back at your life and say, is that me? Am I doing that? And if not, don't just start doing those things. Get back to the circles and figure out where you are and what it's going to take to get to the next level. What it is you haven't denied. What it is you haven't... What it is you love more than God. What it is... Figure out what that is. Fix that little problem. Boom. God's got himself a disciple. Stand with me in the ground. All right, here's what I want to do today. We're just going to pray. I'm going to tell you about some things. We're going to pray. And I want you to leave. Unless, unless, you're not ready to leave. Unless God has kind of started tickling on you a little bit and said, see there? I thought you were a disciple, but you're not really. You've been playing a really good game, but I'm going to win. Any of those five marks you're kind of struggling with? What I'm asking everybody else to do is just kind of work that direction. Coffee shop, go hang out there. Breakfast room, go hang out there. It's probably food later. Front porch, back porch, whatever. Leave this front open. Don't hang out up here and talk, but let, let people come and, and, and meet with God. And if you're headed that direction, look back. And if you see somebody up here, Come be with them. Now put your arm on their shoulder. You don't need to speak any words of wisdom into their lives. You know. Pray with them. Let them know. I'm here. You're not alone. I'm just as screwed up as you are. And while you're up here, there's three tags left on my left or your left. That truth. There's three tags left on that truth. And that's kind of disconcerting, but not really because we just put them on. <laughs> three tags. Left. What's really disconcerting is that we've got to have all 67 tags and gifts back by Wednesday. We have 12. Bring them back by Wednesday. With the tags attached to your unwrapped gift. So those three dances here. God needs to meet some people up here. The rest of us are going to go hang out together and love on each other and be loud and drink coffee. 
Tonight, 6.30 over in the retreat center. Bring some appetizers. Come eat together. Watch a movie. Christmas movie. Good time. Then in the bulletin, there's lots of stuff going on before Christmas. Be a part of everything. Don't ask, Don't think what you should be a part of. I'm challenging everybody to be a part of everything. Next Sunday night's one of the second biggest thing we do here at Beach Family. And if you aren't here, those who belong here more than four times a year, you're not here. You can't get it done. Everybody be here. It's really important. Friday night, we've got to wrap all this stuff. That's really important. Be here. And ask God, am I disciple? What's that mean in my life? Let me pray for you. God, I'm going to ask that you just work among us. That you just get a hold of us. Don't just tap on our heart, God. For those of us who need to get real with you, I'm going to ask you to get a hold of our hearts. God, I'm going to ask that you provide the courage to respond to this. That when we look at our life and we, we understand these five things that you've set up there for us to decide if we really are disciples or not, that you can help us look at our life and fix those things that we've put over you, that we're not following you. God, I thank you for the list. I thank you for the reminder that it provides to me. But I need to remember you're in charge of my life. I don't need anybody else. I don't need any help. If it doesn't come from you, it's not me. So I thank you for everything you do for us. I know it's you. God, I pray that as in this season of Christmas and things that are going on with God, you never ever get lost sight of it. And you're a paramount in gift buying, gift giving, in travel, in everything. You are eternal. If you're not, pray you become that way in my life. In your name we pray.